got the green light and we are now ready to go. Uh, welcome. Welcome to our webinar today. What organizations actually need to know about artificial intelligence, chat GPT, and more. Uh, hopefully you're in the right place and you're going to learn some really interesting stuff from a great conversation today. I'll introduce myself, uh, Moj Laos here in Armanino's AI lab based out of the Chicago office. And just like ChatGPT, if I speak by myself too much, people think I'm hallucinating. So the good news for everyone listening is that I'm here with our esteemed panel of those hopefully familiar faces that you've met uh, through a series of our videos. And we're going to get into some of those popular topics um, in AI and generative you know, AI today. So uh, let's start with those introductions. Derek, why don't you say hi? Hi, everyone. My name is Derek Magdafrau. I've been with Armanino for about five years, and I help lead up our AI lab. Lauren? Hi, everyone. Lauren Renninger, part of Armanino's business analytics and automation team. Been with the, the firm about three years and uh, based out of San Diego, California. And last but not least, Talbot. Hi, everyone. Talbot Hardy. Uh, I am a fellow at Armanino. I've been here about five years in our strategy and transformation. Fantastic. So today's session um, is going to be something somewhat informal and somewhat fun. It's going to be a continuation of some of the videos that we filmed before. Uh, it's going to be a roundtable format where we're going to open it up with some basic background information. If you're coming in without you know, a strong understanding of what some of these topics are, don't worry. We're going to bring you up to speed for exactly what this news technology is, you know, how it works, and what exactly is ChatGPT and those buzzwords that you're hearing. Go into some realistic use cases. Let's look at what can be done, uh, what can't, what are some of those limitations and what are things that we see today? And then perhaps most importantly, we're gonna open up and broaden that discussion to figure out what does that mean? Um, you know, it's one thing to just be a headline or a flash in the pan, but what do we see as a lasting piece of what this technology is going to do? How are we gonna see that incorporated in the future? I and mean, what we're looking at is the tip of the iceberg. And what we wanna get into is how we're actually gonna evolve and how this technology is really gonna change our everyday life um, and what that's going to look like. So first and foremost though, let's give a little background on, on exactly what we're talking about. Because again, this news travels so quickly. I mean, it's incredible. There are models now that are 27 days old and they already feel outdated. Uh, so to narrow that discussion, we're gonna open up with an explanation on what exactly is generative AI. And for context, again, um, you know, you hear about AI in a broad sense, and of course, there's a lot of different aspects of that. That could be a self-driving car, or this could be a chatbot. And then you also hear about kind of the GPT-based models and those really specific uh, chat-based interfaces and tools along those lines. What we're actually going to do is look through the lens of the middle ground. You know, what is that overarching category, and you know, why is it new and exciting, and what exactly does that mean? So, Derek, I'll hand it off to you. Let's take a look. What exactly is generative AI? And although I just said I'm going to hand it off, that was a lie. One thing I'll note, if you do have any questions, I mean, especially some of this part where you go to the technical, but really at any point, you know, feel free to put that in the comments there. We're going to answer them as well as we can or add them in and we'll take a look at it. So go ahead, Derek. Well, thank you, OJ. So I guess at a very basic level, generative AI is a type of artificial intelligence that can create or generate new content. This includes images, texts, music, videos. And these systems are trained on a very specific set of data to recognize patterns and features within that training data set. So to give an example, what we're looking at is a sample of training data that can be added to a generative model or an algorithm. And the AI will actually identify the common patterns and features within the training data. So in this example, given the pictures, it might start identifying wrinkles or graying hair. Then when a new sample is introduced to the pre-trained model, the model itself can then manipulate those images in order to match the patterns and features that were learned from the original training data. In this example, it ages the picture. In a very similar fashion, this is how ChatGPT was also trained. So at a high 50,000 foot level, textual data was collected from a variety of sources, be it that web pages, books, Wikipedia, and all of that textual data was fed into an AI algorithm. So once the AI algorithm has begun to identify the features of the training data, 
a new prompt can then be entered into the chat by a user. And the AI algorithm, whose primary objective is to complete the prompt, uses those features and patterns identified from the training data in order to respond back in a normal user conversational context. So I think the ability to create is, I mean, obviously the generative, generative AI, and it seems to be what stands out the most, you know, I mean, that's what we're not used to. It's one thing to ask a chat bot for the weather, and it's been trained to say very well, the weather is 76 degrees. And yes, it knows to say 76 instead of 75, but that isn't the same as creating something new. And that's imperative to what is taking the world by storm. So, uh, you know, let's look at the elephant in the room. Um, although there's many flavors of this technology, you know, you could be generating images, you could be generating songs, you could be generating anything. Uh, you know, the one that's the claim to fame and the most probably exciting is, um, you know, the GPT models and specifically the use of Chad GPT, you know, for good reasons, had over a billion visitors, um, you know, since earlier in this year for something that's new, one of the fastest growing uh, web applications in history. And if you've used it, it's no surprise. So, I mean, if you haven't, essentially what we're talking about here is in, you know, chatbot AI model that has the ability to generate that new text. And it's this large language model that creates a whole new level of communication than previously you've ever seen. And we're going to show you some specific examples of what that looks like to get a field for it shortly. But I think we got to focus on why it's so different. Um, and it really kind of boils down to, to two things. Uh, the large of the large language models, what makes this all possible. But number one is I think the understanding. Natural language processing or the ability to speak to these to speaker type, right? Communicate with these tools with the natural language has been, you know, critical. It's the thing that always throws you out of the loop when you know you're talking to a bot or to a robot that no one likes to see. And that's where this new technology completely blows the doors off of what you've seen before. Through multi-turnability and the ability to have long conversations, it truly now feels like you're talking to a person. The reason it's able to do that, I mean, GPT-4 was trained on 100 trillion parameters. So think of that as little ways to fine tune that exact information and understand that context. And that number is honestly, it's hard to comprehend. Um, and it's to a point that, you know, we're reaching the ways kind of the human brain thinks about things. But it's simple when you break it down, because if we were to read a sentence about a bird, we understand it's about that flying animal. But where you need those different parameters and understanding is to fine tune that to get to the exact specifics. If someone says a talon or a beak or an egg or any other kind of contextual clues, the more and more data you get to train that data set on is how you make that incredibly realistic. And that is absolutely pivotal to making these tools useful. That way you always know you're getting the right response matched to that right prompt that feels a natural way. Now, the second half to that, if you train a hundred trillion things, you pick up some information along the way. So the other big breakthrough of where this technology sits is through that sheer amount of knowledge. Um, these systems were trained on, you know, really children of the internet, born up in a world where they can read millions of articles, websites, it's trained from social media posts, so that not only can you communicate with these tools as if they're real people, the breadth of their knowledge is incredible. I mean, you can ask questions about Renaissance paintings and you can ask questions about what you should make for dinner um, in a way that's so broad. It truly is, um, I think, a game changer in our ability to use these tools in a variety of new ways. So that knowledge and that ability to apply it is what is massively different and probably what brought a lot of people here. I mean, it's not going to be a surprise. You've seen articles about how ChatGPT can run your business, how it can change your life, how you can do everything through those tools. The reason for that capability is that contextual understanding and the ability to back that up with the actual knowledge um, and capabilities of what's there. Now, one thing I'll say, these systems do have limitations. You know, you'll see people throwing around the ideas of general intelligence and the ability to kind of do everything under the sun. And I, I'm here to unfortunately tell you, if that's what you're hoping that I'd say, we aren't quite there yet. 
Um, you know, there are extreme limitations still to what exists. I'll note for the purpose of this webinar, we're going to use ChatGPT as essentially the high level lens that we're viewing this. I mean, for those that are on the call, if you're aware, there's a variety of tools based off of both those GPT models, um, which is really the newest technology that we'll get into a little bit towards the end of the call, as well as competing offerings as well, BARD and others. Um, but for sake of simplicity, we're gonna use it like Kleenex in this case, as far as just a general term that we're using to make sure that it's the most straightforward. Um, but when using, we'll call it chat GPT and those GPT based tools, it is important to know, you know what you can and can't do. They're great at those coherent conversations with that base level information that we just spoke about. They can write you content. They can feel like a person with a creative inspiration and give you these ideas, but there are limitations. Um, specifically with the ability to do, you know, some maths and logical translations of some things and images, especially, although it's getting better. Uh, recent information is problematic. Well, there's new extensions and many ways to connect the internet to these models, remember the benefit that we're talking about here is the training that was done in the past. And a lot of that training to get to that level of comprehension is you know, gonna be on data sets from before 2021. So it's not gonna be the best tool today. Although again, caveat is these things are changing every day. There are exceptions um, for pulling the most up-to-date information. It excels at things where you, know, you can have a broad level of knowledge of a variety of years it's accumulated to understand it. And then from a business standpoint, I think it's behooves us to call out some of the limitations as well. I mean, a lot of what people are using when they say I'm using ChatGPT is essentially kind of that, that free option that's in test or even a few of the paid for version, but it's not exactly enterprise level. Um, you know, as much as we'd love to believe in the hype that you can move your entire business to these tools, at the same time, there's a very high probability that you might be locked out because it's over capacity. It is a victim of its own success to a certain extent. So using that front interface um, can be a little bit tricky and a little bit risky. And then not last but not least is the sensitivity of data that you're submitting to those tools. We've seen Samsung take a little bit of heat for sharing some of their proprietary information into the system. It is important to note that whatever you're sending in to the tool is going to be visible to a third party. Um, now you can opt out of training and there's some protection for you there. The realistic, you know, chances of someone back engineering, what you said are low, but low is not zero. And I do think it's important, especially as people utilize this new technology that they don't do so blindly. And we understand that we are submitting our information. So before you give away that billion dollar idea, or perhaps more importantly, some of your firms, you know, surprises that you don't want made public, be very wary of what you're putting into these tools for now. Um, so with that though, and that's the, that's the end of my sad part of the story here. Let's talk about some really cool examples though, of how we've actually, you know, what the technology can do today and um, see it in action. So Derek, I'll flip it back to you. Awesome. Well, thank you. And, you know, since seeing tends to be a little bit more impactful than just believing, let's, let's actually look at how this tool functions. So to start this off, at its core, ChatGPT offers a conversational interface for answering questions. So I can ask the bot whether it can summarize the plot of 2001, A Space Odyssey, and it will immediately respond back with a summary of the movie that's nearly indistinguishable from a human. But ChatGPT also remembers the history and the context of a conversation, which allows for multi-turn conversations. So if I ask it its opinion of HAL 9000, the bot is able to quickly respond without requiring any additional information. However, this also points out a limitation. Due to its programming, ChatGPT is unable to provide any personal thoughts or emotions with respect to a topic. <laughs> You'll have to excuse me. <laughs> and we have a computer issue. That's okay. So let's talk through then the next example that you were going to Sure. Have. So more than just a conversational interface, the bot also has the capability of doing massive amounts of knowledge retrieval. So 
in my next example, I had actually asked the bot if it knew who won Super Bowls 16, 19, 23, 24, and 26. And the bot didn't have any issues responding back with the San Francisco 49ers. That's pretty impressive because it can then go back into a whole array of databases and actually source information for us. Within that same example, though, it did highlight some of the limitations that ChatGPT has. For example, I had asked ChatGPT whether or not or who, which quarterback, the Super Bowl 58, 49, if the 49ers would win Super Bowl 58, who would be the starting quarterback? And obviously, because that is a future event, the chatbot was unable to respond back. I could then actually correct that chat GPT response and tell it explicitly, no, Brock Purdy will actually be the quarterback that the San Francisco 49ers will win Super Bowl 58 with. And what's interesting about this and this example is that it still believes Brock Purdy was playing at Iowa State, which highlights one of the limitations that OJ brought up earlier. Because ChatGPT was trained on information prior to 2022, it cannot source a more current, up-to-date impression of what of today's events. Moving forward into the demonstrations, I think the next really important concept here is that it's not just a multi-turn conversational bot or has the have the capabilities for knowledge retrieval. It also has some very advanced language reasoning skills. So I could actually ask ChatGPT to come up with a riddle that uses desk as the answer. And ChatGPT was able to take the relationships new about a desk, be it the legs, the top of a desk, drawers, and start relating that in a way that created a very believable and usable riddle. What's more than that is that ChatGPT could actually translate that same riddle directly into Spanish. So not only does ChatGPT have these advanced language and reasoning capabilities, but it also can translate into over 95 different languages. That's incredibly impressive to me. Some of the other advanced functionality that ChatGPT offers are some skills like adding TLDR to the end of a of a anything. You can copy a URL link and add TLDR. And for those who do not know what TLDR stands for, it stands for too long, didn't read. So I can copy a URL link, add TLDR, and ChatGPT will automatically summarize the entire article into a usable bite-sized paragraph. This can help you go through your morning news very rapidly. It can help you summarize emails very quickly. Or if your student or if your son or daughter come home with a report on a book that you know they didn't read, they most likely used TLDR as well. Where, Can I ask you my, something about that, Derek? Yeah, please. Because um, it just made me laugh just thinking about it as you, you know, explained TLDR, too long, didn't read. I, yeah. I think one of the most interesting things about the way these systems work is that historically that meant there was some engineer having a good time in programming. I'm going to add. TLDR mode. Like that was a distinct decision that someone had made to add mm -hmm. every functionality that these different prompts add when that actually isn't the case, right? I mean, they didn't set out OpenAI in this case to make, we're going to add this TLDR functionality on the product roadmap. Rather, it has the context to understand that term and then understand what you're asking and then go ahead and synthesize and summarize that article for you. That's right. Uh, because it's been trained on such a wide array of information, TLDR was one of those things it was trained on. It understood conceptually that too long didn't read meant to summarize an article. And because it understood that relationship, it can then utilize that relationship in its interactions with us. So taking something that was perhaps an acronym and making it useful as a bot. Um, yeah, as a bot. Yeah. And there's the generative part of it, right? That's it's creating it. something that no one knew. And that's the beauty of it. And I'll let you get to this last one here, but it, it has capabilities that we don't know because quite frankly, it's just the limit is our imagination and just it uses these prompts to build these things out. And that's why you continue to see new and new things that are coming. And it's part of the excitement about these tools is that it is so broad that we can think of new things, new ways on the fly to utilize this technology. 
Absolutely. I think prompt engineering is going to become something that becomes more commonplace for us the more and more we use these tools, right? Right now, we're just being introduced to a whole new realm of capabilities with these large language models, and they will naturally evolve with us as we learn to use them more and more efficiently. And I think a great example of that is what's happening with development, the citizen developer being able to take something that was written in human language, for example, asking ChatGPT to create a blog website. And I can give it some very basic instructions about how I want it formatted, what kind of blog postings I want, where I want certain areas of my website located. And with those very simple instructions, ChatGPT can actually print out the HTML code and the corresponding CSS code for me to launch an entire web page. And this is something I've actually done. In about five minutes, I had an entire working web page for a generic blog that was completely created and crafted using ChatGPT. Now, just think about that for a moment. We can now have anybody creating uh, programs on a computer, websites for blog posts or a website for a business or any other of the programming language, I could do data analysis, all using ChatGPT by asking in normal language for it to perform some task. It's really incredible stuff. And I mean, especially even more so, if you don't know what those acronyms, HTML, CSS mean, here's the good news. You don't ever have to know ever again. Good point. Because it's leveling the playing <laughs> field and establishing the capability to you know automate things for people that didn't quite frankly have those capabilities before um, and, and, you know, really extend that opportunity. So let's extend it here now. Um, we got a lot of smiling faces here and let's get to everyone else. Let's talk through. I mean, those are some great examples that we spoke through there, Derek. Um, let's see, like Lauren, what was your favorite example that you've seen with this technology or, or that you've used? Selfishly, I'm loving it right now for a lot of research, uh, specifically when it comes to like benchmarking data, right? Uh, I think it's really helpful to be able to provide um, baseline so you know, right? Like when I'm working with a prospect or with a client, I know like, hey, we're we're way off base here, way off of like where we should be from an industry standard um, without having to spend the painful hours like searching Gartner and Forrester and this, that, and the other for that data, right? Um, that's something that can take a, a, a long amount of time. Um, so yeah, that's that's my favorite at the moment, but I'm sure that will expand as I get more comfortable. No one's going to complain or weep for lost time that we did to research that is now gone. It lets us right? do some <laughs> higher value work. Uh, Less time just... on my computer, the better. <laughs> There you go. There you go. And that's the computer still doing it. You just don't have to be there. Right. That's the yep. beauty of it. Um, so yeah, tell about, how about yourself? I know you've had some really cool use cases in the past. What's wowed you or gotten you the most excited? Uh, I, I have to, I have to echo Lauren on the, on the professional front The the, I mean, chat GPT is already really helping us um, go deeper, broader, faster in our client strategy engagements. We're just covering way more ground. Um, and the way we're using it is really around um, exploration and consideration. So, um, you know, while we all have our own expertise and, you know, and, and, you know, the best practices example is a good one. Um, a lot of times chat GPT will add a little bit, you know, just a couple of little clicks out of the box of things that you hadn't normally thought of and allow you to kind of chase down and pull on those threads and uh, just kind of get more comprehensive with the strategies that you're developing. On the personal front, uh, just a recent example, we were traveling, I went to Nashville, Tennessee, my wife and I. Um, had dinner at the Bluebird Cafe. We're sitting down there listening to the musicians, having a wonderful time. And of course, it's very inspiring <laughs> to be there. So I started writing lyrics, right? I wrote a bunch of lyrics about our trip and everything. And and I couldn't quite finish them. And so I was, I had some people that wanted to put music to them. And I 
basically took my lyrics and shoved them into chat GPT and asked it to finish <laughs> my song for me and make things rhyme. And we went through a couple of passes and it did a really good job actually. And it helped me finish my song and I sent it off to my friends and they're working on some music for it. Well, you know, pretty soon you won't even need your friends to make, well, not pretty soon, I guess today, quite frankly, <laughs> you don't need your friends to make the music or, or yourself. Well, to even I, know. I know. I <laughs> know. ChatGPT um, is never going to be your friend. So I think, <laughs> I think we have friends for different reasons. Yes. There you go. I, I mean, I, I think what astonishes me when using the tool is just how clever it can be. I mean, I know it shares some of y'all before, but I was playing around with it, thinking of different things we can do here in the regional office. And one of the things, right, we, we try to join or participate in local 5Ks and things like that, little local races. So I asked it to come up with a name for an Armino running club. And I had a couple that were okay. And it said Armor Runners, which fine, so be it. That, that's an okay name, I suppose. Concatenate the name a little bit. But the reasoning behind it is what was incredible because I asked it to explain the name. And it said, well, Armor Runners is going to sound like Army Runners. And Army Runners is going to influence people to think of the team and organization and the dedication of that group working together. And I thought, my God, this tool just tried to incept me. It was putting those images in your head and you hear it right out loud. And you're like, yeah, I guess so. I kind of process that, but I would never think of it that way or necessarily come to that understanding. And it's just, it's just slick. I mean, um, the way you can process that information, which again, goes to the advanced training that you're getting on these tools and get you there is, is where I think it continues to evolve in ways that I just don't even you don't even see it coming, you know, um, and it just continues to shock me in that way. Any last ones, Derek, that you thought were cool or cool examples that you've seen? Uh, I mean, they're coming out all the time. I think where we're really seeing a big push is not necessarily in the examples of how ChatGPT is being used, but in how it's being incorporated into a lot of the solutions that we're seeing today, right? So things like OpenAI's plugins that are coming coming out or, or even Microsoft's Copilot, which is now being integrated into a lot of their sor uh, source products like Microsoft Word and Excel. I think that is where the truly impressive nature of what large language models offer is really going to come to fruition. Yeah. So let's, let's, let's talk more about that because I think it's important. Um, you know, up to this moment, we've essentially been talking about GPT as kind of a monolithic thing, right? That it's just this tool. Um, you use it to talk to and you get information back. But I feel like what's happening more and more is we're finding new ways that these models, and again, just the math and the systems behind the tool are being leveraged in new places. Mm -hmm. um, and if you think of it that way, think of it as, you know, ChatGPT is the, uh, the car, we'll say, but the engine is the valuable piece. And you got a little go-kart, quite frankly, you know, around this giant NASCAR engine. And people are just really starting to unlock the capability to use that engine and um, find new use cases for it and expand the way or what it means to actually use those tools. Mm -hmm. um, and, and what difference do you think that's going to make? Just continue on that point real quick. Well, I mean, if we think about how humans have kind of evolved with computers over time, I, I think that it's drastically changed since the 1940s when punch cards were first used to program these early systems. And those punch cards, you know, were used to represent computer data and instructions to those systems. And then later on, the command prompt was introduced and that eliminated the need for material instructions that physically added to the machine. And although it was superior to the punch card system, the command prompt, it, it was hard and difficult to master. And then in the 90s, Microsoft introduced the graphical user interface, and that became the standard way to engage with personal computers. And users could interact with those systems using that visual interface, but you still needed to know how to navigate the computer's various pro programs in order to operate it effectively. You also had to use a computer mouse and a keyboard. But today, with the introduction of large language models, such as ChatGPT, I think we're seeing a different way of interacting with our computers. And now we're starting to have the capability of using natural language to do it. So in my opinion in the future, I think that these large language models will ultimately form that bridge between the humans and machines. That It'll help us translate our directions directly into instructions for the computer to follow. 
In other words, it, it will help translate our desires into our outcomes. I see that. I, I agree with that. I, I see it shifting though. It's like a fundamental shift. We're going from where we all had to train people on how to use computers to an, an interface where um, we don't have to do that anymore. We kind of it's kind of right. game changing in that way. This is probably the best user interface you know ever when mm -hmm. it comes to just lowering the bar on what it takes to work with uh, with a, with a computer. I hope that I will not have to go to my grandmother's house any longer to fix any computer system. Hopefully she can just <laughs> type it directly into <laughs> ChatGPT and have it all done for her. It's it's the, you know, that used to have the competitive advantage of knowing all the hot keys and how to run yeah. software, or maybe you were an Excel whiz, right? That that knew all these things. And I do think, Talbot, something you said is critical. It's a fundamental shift because we used to be, we trained on how to talk to the computer. Now the computer's training on how to talk to us. Mm -hmm. So the tables have turned. No longer are we going to read whatever for dummies because <laughs> we've realized that we just are dummies, I suppose. And that's that's as good as it's going to get. So they're just going to meet us halfway um, and allow us to use the improper English or talk the way that we do um, to make that stuff work just to get at what we actually are trying to do, right? Now, uh, I, I think when we look at the higher value, again, it goes to not just using this thing to look at knowledge, but let's say like automation and things of that nature. Um, like Lauren, I know you've worked with a lot of clients kind of going through ways to use those processes. And I think if we think of chat GPT, not chat GPT, excuse me, like large language models and GPT is the way to execute those automations is um, where we really see the benefits. I'm just curious, like some examples you've seen, right? Companies have embraced AI just broadly to change the way we're working. Yeah, it's a good question. I, it can be as simple as back office processes, right? That are like, you know, your your AP automation tools that are out there in the in the market as they exist right now. Um, to as sophisticated as tabularizing, you know, PDFs to be able to to then utilize that data in another form or fashion. Um, and varying levels, right? Like sometimes it's a very small chunk of a process that that we're trying to to automate to free up somebody's uh, time, and it's it's tedious. And uh, other times it's, uh, you know, we want to we want to introduce automation to the whole thing. Like I don't even want somebody to have to think about this. I want to have it scheduled to run as as it sits. Uh, so it, it varies, right? Like back office processes, we've talked about predictive analytics models with clients. Um, and so the level of sophistication there, I think just really depends on where they're at um, with their comfortability with automation technology. Um, and that that really varies depending on, on our client, right? Um, and so my goal always is to think through how can we approach this sustainably, scalable, like in a scalable fashion, right? And in a manner in which all parties are comfortable, right? Um, I think it can be a scary or, or daunting conversation to navigate sometimes for people. Um, but when you frame it up in a way of, hey, we're, we're, we wanna automate this so that you get more time to do what you love about your job and to not have to do the tedious tasks and to be able to, to upskill, be more creative in your day-to-day, um, that's really where we start to see the smiles on our clients' faces, for sure. Yeah, and I think, so again, we kind of briefly touched on it. We touched on Microsoft's Copilot, which for the broader audience, it's going to be the integration of some of these GPT models to all the office tools that you know and love. And I think that's where we're going to see that gap. They're bridging that gap. Uh, we want to see the smiles on people's faces. Uh, you said something that I think was important there, that it's just, you know, this is how they actually act. Uh, it's one thing we, we talk about um, the, the use of these models as a tool. And truthfully, that's what they are. They're a tool. They're not the end goal. They're the ability to communicate and use these tools and to get you where you want to be. And we can start talking about end results, not, um, not just the, the way that we get there. Um, yep. And then again, I mean, if we go for changing the way we use Word, changing the way we use Excel, I, those are core functions of business for the past 30 years. Um, so it's like, what a difference that this, I think, technology will make. Um, 
So I do want to want to focus on that though. And let's look at broadly, I mean, outside of the individual use cases and there's tons for automation and help replacing and working with what we do. I do want to talk through how we think this is going to impact businesses and how businesses need to think about this new technology and what it means. Uh, I wrote down a Peter Drucker quote, because the purpose of business is to create a customer. The business enterprise has two and only two basic functions, marketing and innovation. Marketing and innovation produce results. All the rest are costs. Now, I think it's a little bit of a loaded statement. I'll be the first one to admit that, but I don't think we can discount the importance of innovation. Uh, Talbot, curious to get your feedback. I mean, how important do you think it is for businesses to embrace and look at this type of change and incorporate technology as they continue to grow? I think it's huge. And I, I, um, I think from, there, there's, a, you know, there's a handful of cases, I think, already that should be, you know, uh, you know, people should be looking at to kind of enhance their business. But I think going back to this point, so, you know, you just look how fast this is evolving, right? So this thing is going at a clip that is so much faster than we're used to seeing techno technological evolution, right? Where we're, you know, we've been measuring things in years and months, even for, for quite a long time. And we're now down to measuring them in weeks and days, and it'll be, you know, minutes here shortly because the whole, you know, what was J Chat GPT last year when it was announced was all about conversations for innovation, right? AI enabled conversations for in, uh, information. And that's shifting to AI enabled conversations for action here with auto GTPs, like, like, like just really quickly already it's just happening and copilot's a good example of that as well so this whole thing around you know ai being the epitome of time is money is going to be a huge driver for businesses and businesses are going to need to look at their best use cases to apply this some obvious ones customer support content generation uh, training onboarding uh, virtual assistants and something I'd like to call virtual A teams are going to be a huge hit for productivity. And so productivity is just going to go through the roof with this technology as we look at it. So that old ad, it's a, you know, the 10,000 hour rule of what it took you to develop the skills and expertise uh, to be able to take something some idea and have the skills to bring it to reality, it, that, that's gonna get blown away by this. That 10,000 hour rule is gonna be no longer here very, very soon. So if, if we can take our best minds or you know, and I, you know, creative people and put behind them, uh, crack a team of virtual AI, enabled capability that can actually drive action and create things based on ideas. It's just gonna, it's just gonna really, really accelerate how fast we can innovate. Totally agree. Kind of reminds me a little bit of the matrix where you can just plug into the matrix and download jujitsu and all of a sudden you're an expert, right? It, it's very similar in that it's, what we've been kind of calling the great equalizer, because you no longer need to have some of these advanced 10,000 hour skill sets, chat GPT can do it for you with its ability to retrieve knowledge, resurface information is remarkable. And as a result, we now are all kind of working from a very similar skill set. You know, I thought there was actually a good, you know, thing that someone brought up that kind of keys into that in the chat. And well, I can't bring it up here. They asked, you know, show the chat GPT add for Excel. And um, I think that's indicative of the type of use cases that we're going to see that make the immediate impact, quite frankly, it's the small stuff. It's, mm -hmm. and, and for reference, I mean, it is pretty cool the way it works, but all we're doing is just calling these other functions from Excel. Um, and you can actually ask ChatGPT, it'll probably show you. But regardless, point being, the ability to add, you know, I have an Excel file, I can make a command that's going to call out to ChatGPT, and I can have a list of 100 
topics and then all just at once feed that through to get either the calculations or more feedback on the subject matters. It's something that maybe you could have done by hand before. It doesn't change the world, right? I mean, we're not really recreating the wheel, but it's in those tools that you're using every day. And it's allowing you to be that much more you know, marginally or incrementally better than you were previously. Mm -hmm. And I think that's, that's going to be the difference. I mean, you know, you've heard the rate of change in your organization needs to exceed the rate of change outside of your organization. And I think it's absolutely good advice, but to tell its point, the rate at which this technology is changing is at a point that, you know, you'll drive yourself mad trying to beat that rate of change. It's simply not possible. GPT-4 is now 27 days old and people are already you know, pointing out all of the flaws and ways that we can fix it and looking forward to five, 27 days for technology that blew out the previous 100 out of the water. Uh, I mean, I think what we need to think about is the rate of change in your organization needs to exceed that of your competition. And it needs to That's be right. a planned out way to harness this you know, information and new tools in a sane way and sensible way. Um, and it's going to be those small things, using it on a little bit here and there, right? Implementing it into what you do day to day and um, getting better with those tools. Um, and again, to that point, we see questions about, you know, what model to use, three, four, a barred, I mean, very good questions, um, which I know has been dragged through the mud a little bit. But again, it's still, I think, an impressive model, it just hasn't had some of the same success as some of the GPT models had. But one thing I do think it's curious, Derek, and I'll go to you to this, talking about the Excel example reminded me of this, is how do you think companies are actually going to incorporate these GPT models in the future into what they do? Because I'm guessing you're not thinking they're all going to be logging on to chat GPT every day to do their job. That's right. Uh, no, I don't, right? The reality is chat GPT is just a large language model. Like I mentioned it earlier, it, it's, it's designed for multi-turn conversation. But where I see the future of this technology being enabled is when businesses start incorporating it directly into their business models, right? So we've seen this kind of activity with OpenAI's plugins. Companies like Kayak and Expedia, um, Shopify are releasing now the capability for ChatGPT to leverage their databases in the back end and actually perform tasks and actions. So I could go onto Expedia using ChatGPT's plugin and ask it, well, what's available in New York coming up in May 5th? And it will surface all of the different uh, hotel rooms and activities that I could potentially book. That is cool in and of itself that I can actually source that information using natural language. But what's even cooler is now I can ask it to book those vacations for me. So now I actually can do immediate actions using natural language with a given business like Expedia. And the more we create these plugins that act as the ears and the eyes of an organization, the more ChatGPT will become ingrained in the way we perform business and the more we will become accustomed to interacting with it to perform some everyday tasks. I, I think that's right. And I think um, the use of APIs is really ultimately the way people use these models in the future and mm -hmm. build it into their own business processes. So it's mm -hmm. going to be, you're going to have your organizational use of the GPT models on your own data that you're training. And I think that's going to be, we talk about the future of work. We talk about integrating people into the workplace. I truly think that's going to be an immediate area that we see that we're now, think of it, your, your handbook, your solid information, your knowledge and everything else that we keep that, you know, in-house. And then um, you're going to have more control over that and access to it and, um, you know, ability to leverage that information. Um Internally, like I think that's going to be mm -hmm. commonplace and quite frankly, table stakes for a lot mm -hmm. of our uh, clients here today. Yeah, I think you bring up a great example there, right? Um, one of the areas that we see as huge potential for things with for large language models is around knowledge management for an organization. We talk about how we have disparate sources of information across the organization, some structured, some unstructured, um, shared 
on local folders in SharePoint, all of those shared knowledge systems could eventually be uploaded into a system like ChatGPT. And it, it could become a single source of truth for all employees to interact with, start asking questions about human resources. When is our PTO policy? What is maybe create a sales desk within ChatGPT itself to help sales staff understand what they should be pricing certain services or products at. ChatGPT could become that single source of truth for all employees to get their answers or get their questions answered. Uh, so I'm going to ask a question here from the chat because I think it's too good to pass out. And uh, tell I'm going to give it to you because uh, as a Silicon Valley uh, vet, Someone asked, you know, how do they see the evolution of ChatGPT versus the internet bubble of 2000? Um, what's different as someone that was, you know, a big part, right, of the Valley for a long time? What do you see as truly being different this time than before? Uh, I think I think we have to go back to kind of that creativity enablement and the and the productivity gain. I, I love Brad. So Bradley has a question in your chat too, which is in the in the in the text there to us, but um, interesting. I would say this, I um, we are back to, in my view, and I think this is a really positive thing. So what, you know, having been there kind of 30 years ago in the Valley, valley and, you know, and it was really new and exciting back then. And, um, and then kind of the last 10 years or so watching kind of the focus on social media, um, and turning the customer into the product and really not really trying to drive a value proposition for, you know, for paying for consumer applications. I think this represents a huge shift back to applications that both businesses and consumers are probably going to want to pay for because they're going to be helping them get things done. And again, you know, the, the aphorism of time is money, right? That is true both in our personal lives and our business lives. And this technology has an ability to impact that probably more than any others. And it can also string all the others together. So that's what I see is different here. And uh, I don't know if you want to address this this other one is in here. Well. We, we could talk about it sure and let's lead into the next section so I, I see we got some questions here about the singularity in the future and what that's going to yeah. look like um lauren let me let me flip back to you there's obviously a lot of change that's happening here a lot of fear be it lost jobs to computers mm -hmm. taking over the world i mean what worries you about this technology or what are your concerns as you know we have all this excitement building up yeah i think um it stems back to a healthy level of scrutiny, right? I I think as users of of Chat GPT, even like as you know, as as uh, revolutionary and as simplistic as it is, right? We always have a healthy level of scrutiny in the responses that we're getting back, right? Um, there's I'm always looking for a reference to a source. If I'm researching, I right, I'm looking like was this even logical, right? Like. It's beautiful that uh, ChatGPT responds in natural language that you and I understand, and there's a healthy level of sophistication to those responses, but you got to take a second and pause and think like, does this make sense, right? We can't kind of take it for gospel, if you will. And so I think what scares me personally, or like what I think um, I get nervous about is like that level of scrutiny is only going to, to decrease as larger and larger advancements continue to to come out right to talbot's point the rat the rate at which these the innovation of of ai is happening is drastic and it's it's fast right which is both exciting but also kind of scary when you take into consideration like not everyone is going to have that healthy level of scrutiny when utilizing um artificial intelligence and so that's my perspective, but I know that there's there's a lot of other thoughts on it for sure. Yeah, I mean, so we saw the open letter about AI and concerns about, right, the advancement of this technology. I guess the question is, Derek, I'll go to you. Can we put the genie back in the bottle? 
Um, I think <laughs> we could talk about the singularity and what the future looks like, but I mean, what, what is our options at this point and how do we see it playing out? I think our options are responsible use. And I think Lauren hit it on it as well. I think everything that we utilize chat to be for, we have to take it with a grain of salt and be aware that it can hallucinate. It can give incorrect information. But the reality is it's not going away. And as time progresses, these models are going to get better and better and better. But it is on the user to really ensure that the information that has been returned from ChatGPT is correct before you ever start utilizing it for other activities. I, uh, the genie is not going back in the bottle. No, definitely I not. Say. Uh, this technology has the same problem as all the other technologies. The problem is people, and some of us are good and some of us are not. And what needs to happen with this technology is what needs to happen with all technologies. The pace at which we develop the use for good must outpace the use for bad, and it must actually offset it. So... So the effort that we put in uh, to defeat the misuse of this should be huge. It needs to be huge. And, um, and I think we can, you know, obviously, if we put our minds to it, we could do that. But I think it, in, in no way do we go backwards or try to stuff this down. And because, uh, you know, even if we try to do that here, it will be done somewhere else. Right. So it might as well be here. I, I, I think that's right. And I think it actually ties into another question that was asked about how do we feel about people, students, especially using these tools to learn and how to train and how to get places. And again, I mean, I think putting our heads in the sand, be it that we're a professor or a uh, CTO, I mean, I just don't think it's going to work. Now, I do not think we endorse it. I think you have to stay, you know, make sure we're mindful and people are still using their brains, but it doesn't remind me a little bit. Think of things like spell check. Um, let's be honest. I think everyone's spelling probably took a hit and we have to be realistic about that. When we rely on these systems to aid and help, I have a very similar fear about driving. I uh, cannot fathom what people would do if they lost their backup cameras. I think a lot of shopping carts would be lost that day. <laughs> um, but again, I, it doesn't mean we step back necessarily. I mean, I think it means we just need to look at this reliance head on, understand what those limitations are, and then make sure that we're evolving with this technology and the best ways to use it. And then we're staying abreast of what that's going to look like, right? I mean, I think the only thing we can do is be level-headed and smart about how we incorporate it. And that's going to be especially true as it becomes more and more integrated than what we do. Right now, it's easy to think of it as a monolithic thing. If I just don't go to BARD to use one of these models, um, I know some people have some questions about the specifics of it. I can tell you the new stuff's always better, although it gets more expensive. But regardless, for a minute, if I'm not leveraging one of these tools directly, am I staying out of it and keep my hands clean? And that's going to be impossible. As more and more systems are integrating that, is this going to become more and more partial to what you do? I don't think it's going to be able to be something that you avoid, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. People carry cell phones around everywhere they go. you know. And there's a lot of this technology that's proven. It's a privacy concern and other risk factors, but um, it's just going to be built into, it's like I, I do think we mentioned before, the interface to the different technology um, that's there. And it's going to be, I think, commonplace. Is you couldn't avoid the window on a computer. I think it's going to be the same way using these large language models. I think to remark on that a little bit further too is, look, there are concerns with putting information into chat GPT, right? Or any of these other large language models. There is a potential that the information could resurface. And I think we all need to be aware and cognizant of that concern. Um, on the flip side of that, there's also a concern with putting personal information into email as well. But how often do we do that? So there is a balancing act between the concerns around risk and how much that risk will translate into actual ill effects. And I think we need to be kind of always aware and moving towards a right, the right, right way of handling that kind of uh, information in these chatbots. Okay, we got about five minutes left here. I do want to end on a happier note and want to talk through you know, what people are most excited about or looking forward to. 
Derek already said he's looking forward to not talking to his grandmother. I think that's fine. But let's see what everyone else thinks is going to be the true benefit that they're looking for from these tools. Who do we got? Lauren, come on. What do you got? What are you most excited yeah. for? <laughs> like, I think I said it earlier. Uh less, well, I shouldn't say less time at my computer because obviously you have to use your computer to utilize chat GPT, but I think less time doing the the painful things, right? Less time sifting through um, endless articles and information trying to dissect a, a an intelligent small nugget that I can utilize uh, moving forward, right? I think I'm looking forward to more time hopefully being creative and solutioning for for our clients and their problems uh rather than maybe doing some of the the more mundane kind of tedious tasks if you will um that is very much what i am looking forward to and hopefully that leads to to more out time outside uh doing the things that i love so there you go how about you talbot i am really looking forward to the the just the the harnessing the power and of the skill enablement. So, um, you know, as a creative person, right. You know, I, I love writing. Like I said, I can't write music. And if I had the, if I had, you know, a virtual assistant helping me write music to my lyrics, fantastic. If I had, I also don't know cat, but I like to design things. Right. And so, having the ability to take those ideas and have someone turn, you know, have, have an AI enablement to turn that into something that could be handed to, you know, a 3D printer, a CNC router, or what, a, you know, an automated welding bot, whatever it is. But think about what's coming here in terms of enabling you to do things that you don't have the skill to do today, but you have the imagination to want to create with. And mm -hmm. I think that's what I'm most excited about what people will do with this. I, I do think it shifts the onus on human beings to be able to focus more on the problem than the solution. Like we saw a great one come out. Someone commented healthcare and it's 100% spot on. Um, you know, we can worry about what we want to fix. We're well aware of the you know, maladies and diseases that we get, but this allows us now to be able to find solutions that we couldn't have otherwise done. And now we have like, right, bots working with other teams of bots and all that type of agent technology and everything that's changing. And I do think that's what's the most interesting is the ability to, there are so many people in this world that know a problem they're trying to solve, but for whatever reason, they don't have access to the knowledge, the technology, the information to be able to come up to be able to solve those problems. It is democratizing that, equalizing that, and getting the yeah. ability to source out the right problems into people's hands, and we can use these tools to help uh, answer that. Uh, only a couple minutes here. I'll let you answer that one, Derek. Any other closing thoughts that you wanna talk about there? I think that this is the technology that's gonna define the future. I think we're gonna look back at this point in time and realize that this was a shift where artificial intelligence became a household everyday concept. I think that for me personally, when we start seeing that human machine interface really evolve where we can use our natural language to interact with computers, where we can start using computers um, for, like Talbot said, things that we perhaps don't ourselves know how to do, but we can instruct a computer to do it for us. That's where that that shift in how we utilize computers is really going to occur. And I'm excited to see what the future brings. I think that's right. Alexa asked me what I'm trying to tell it nine times a day. This is the first time <laughs> it's going to be able to actually do what we need to do. And it's shifting to having this technology, I think, serve us truly than us contorting ourselves to help answer the technology. Um, okay. I think we're sitting out here time. That was great. I appreciate everyone that was able to join virtually. I appreciate my fellow panelists. I hope you learned something great comments in the commentary and, um, well, I hope to talk to y'all soon and we'll answer any questions that we can that come in. Thank you. Thank Thanks, you everybody.